Yeah. Hope you are all doing well. Okay. So now uh, we are on the free webinars before we, uh, like, you know, it's kind of a warming up session before we start off with the entrance preparation so that you will get an idea about our focus and how we will be dealing with uh, various topics on each and every subject like that. So today um, I'm going to discuss on the Dendigir assist, uh, mainly focusing, being me, an oral medicine and radiologist, I'll be focusing on the radiographic features and the radiographic differential diagnosis. Yeah, uh, I hope all of you can uh, hear me and am I audible? I hope the screen also is uh, visible for you all. So uh, let's begin the session. Uh, so what is actually a cyst? Can anyone just tell me? See, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want all of you to give the exact definition and all. Just what is your uh, general idea of what is a cyst? When the term cyst comes, what it means? Simply, it is a fluid filled. Yes, it's a fluid filled cavity, right? Fluid or semi fluid or even air filled cavity. But we say a true cyst means it should have an epithelial lining. If there is no epithelial lining, then it is not a true cyst. For example, staphne bone defect or staphne bone cyst, we say. But actually, since it does not have an epithelial lining, it is not a true cyst, right? So, cyst means something a fluid filled bony lesion. Uh, which usually has an epithelial lining. That is what is a true cyst. Okay, so dentigerous cyst means it is a cyst that encloses the crown of an unerupted tooth. So what usually encloses the crown of an unerupted tooth? Generally, an unerupted tooth is enclosed by, the crown of an unerupted tooth is enclosed by something. What is that? What is that called as? Come on. Yeah, reduced enamel epithelium. Uh, okay, but what if, what do we say that? What is the term used for something that, you know, envelops the crown of an unerupted tooth? We say the follicle, the follicular space, right? So, dendigerous cyst is the one that encloses the crown of an unerupted tooth, but how? By causing the expansion of the follicle or the follicular space. So, that is why a cyst comes in that aspect, okay? So usually the crown of an uninterrupted tooth is enclosed by a uh, reduced enamel epithelium that is actually called as a follicular space, right? So when uh, that follicular space expands due to some pathology, then it is called as a dentigerous cyst. So usually that is attached to the neck of the tooth. Since because of that, we also term dentigerous cyst as a follicular cyst, but not quite commonly used. Dendigerous cyst is an apt name, but still, some cases we say follicular cyst, which is a synonym for dendigerous cyst. So, what are the few features of dendigerous cyst in general? It is the second most common cyst of the jaws. So, can you name which is the first common or the commonest cyst of the jaw? This is the second most common, right? So, which is the first one? Which is the commonest one? Yes, very good. Radicular cyst, right? The periapical or the radicular cyst is the most common cyst of the jaw. So this dendigerous uh, cyst is said to be developmental in nature because it develops from the remnants of reduced enamel epithelium. That is a follicle, dental for, I mean follicular space. Okay, so it is also called as a developmental cyst. So usually uh, between the layers of the reduced enamel epithelium or between the epithelium and the crown of the unerupted tooth, fluid starts accumulating as a pathologic process. That is how the cyst develops. That is the pathogenesis behind dendigerous cyst. The soft tissue counterpart of a dendigerous cyst, that is when it leaves the bony cavity and if it is seen within the soft tissue overlying the, uh, you know, the jaws, then we say it as eruption cyst. Okay, so the soft tissue counterpart of a dendigerous cyst is called as eruption cyst. Now let's move on to the clinical features of dendigerous cyst. So 
mostly we said uh, it's most commonly in i mean dentigerous systems associated with the crowns of an unerupted tooth so which is the most before we move it is the most uh, common uh, you know impacted tooth or you know unerupted tooth in our oral cavity which is the most common one which is the most common unerupted tooth yes the mandibular third molars right after that after mandibular third molars yeah maxillary third molar then maxillary canine very good then comes the mandibular second premolars kind of okay so here the dentigerous cyst considering that order dentigerous cyst is also most commonly associated with the most common impacted tooth or the unerupted tooth that is the mandibular third molar then we give a preference to the maxillary canine which has a more uh, potential for the developing or transforming into a dentigerous cyst the maxillary canines because they usually come a long way down before eruption so maxillary canine is another one then comes the maxillary third molar some books they have given both maxillary canine and the maxillary third molar an equal predilection but uh, mostly it is maxillary canine then comes maxillary third molar and then mandibular second premolars so is dentigerous cyst associated with only the unerupted uh, teeth or anything else I mean the usual components or usual number of teeth. Okay, that is okay. Then anything else? It can also be associated with supernumerary teeth, right? The supernumerary teeth are also usually noted most commonly as a routine radiographic finding only, right? So it can also be associated with the crowns of an impacted supernumerary teeth. so which is the most commonly associated tooth which could be the most commonly associated uh, supernumerary tooth in that case which which could be the most commonly associated supernumerary yes mesodents very good so mesodents is the most commonly involved supernumerary tooth associated with dentigerous cyst then dentigerous cyst can also develop surrounding an odontogenic odontogenic are also tooth like structures right excuse me <coughs> <coughs> sorry i was having a bout of cold so uh, odontomes are also tooth like structures right so surrounding an odontom also dentigerous cyst can happen then associated in the second and third decade of life so much more younger age group okay how does they present how does dentigerous cyst present usually they present with a a long standing slow growing painless swelling okay of the jaws okay it's a bony lesion so it it will be located in the jaws so it will be bony in nature once you palpate okay so usually they say it's slow growing there is no pain associated and all okay so if it grows to a great extent it can cause expansion of the jaws causing asymmetry of the jaws okay if that expansion brings about thinning out of the involved bone then that can lead to a crepitus on palpation then it can bring about any you know it can cause the erosion of the involved bone and resulting in a fluctuant rubbery fluctuant swelling on palpation so that can all happen if the cyst expands beyond a limit okay otherwise usually it is just an expansive bony lesion slow growing and painless very rarely they cause pain if it gets secondarily infected and all because mostly dentigerous cyst is an aggressive lesion but still it will never invade the bony canal i mean the nerve canal and all okay it will not cause invasion because it's the cyst it is not a tumor in uh, uh, nature so even though it is aggressive it will never cause invasion into the nerve canal very rare it's, it doesn't occur at all so because of that pain initially is very uncommon okay only if it is secondarily infected like long standing cases or recurrent pericoronitis happening with an partially impacted tooth in such cases also dentigerous cyst can occur so in only in those cases pain will be elicited so uh, can you tell me uh, conditions in which multiple dentigerous cyst are noted very important mcq question multiple dentigerous cyst are noted in which all syndromes or which all conditions 
<coughs> yes, golden gold syndrome, very good. Other need for golden gold syndrome? It's basal cell liver syndrome. Then pedocranial dysplasia. There are also multiple impacted supernumerary too. So because of that, chances of multiple dendigerous cysts is common. Then there is something called as Maritax Lamy syndrome. It's a kind of mucopolysaccharidosis, type six or something. So in that case is also uh, the excess mucopolysaccharide starts depositing in all the internal organs within the follicular spaces and all, causing the chance of development into a dendigerous cyst. So in all these three conditions, multiple dendigerous cyst should be suspected. <clears throat> now, so we are now going to focus more on the uh, radiologic or the aspect, the exact position and aspects of the dendigerous cyst, okay? So the epicenter of the dendigerous cyst is usually above the crown of the involved tooth. So we say it is a pericoronal, that means surrounding the crown of the involved tooth. It is a radiolucent lesion. So it's a pericoronal, present as a pericoronal radiolucency radiographically. So the attachment to the cemento enamel junction or the neck of the tooth is very important radiographic finding. And even during surgery also, this finding has to be confirmed to consider it as a dendigerous cyst. Surgically also, when you remove the tooth along with the cyst, then in that condition also, you should be able to make out the attachment of the cystic line into the cemento enamel junction of the tooth. That is a very important point. Radiographically also, this should be elicit. I mean, this, we should be able to make out the attachment to the CEG. Okay? Then usually the it presents with a well corticated, well defined, smooth outline. Unless it is secondary infected, it will present usually with a very well defined, well corticated, smooth outline. Mostly it will be unilocular in nature. So it will have a curved or circular, that means you know, a round shaped oval or an oval shaped swelling, enveloping the crown symmetrically mostly. It is a unilocular radiolucency. So the inside of the lesion is completely radiolucent. You cannot see any radiograph, radio, I mean, uh, a radio opaque foci is usually not made out in case of a dendigerous system. So it's a completely radiolucent lesion, mostly unilocular. So you cannot make out any septa and all, but if it is a long standing condition and you know, progressing to a greater extent, we are noticing the dendigerous cyst after a large greater expansion, then because of the, uh, you know, the sp spreading nature, it can may present with a uh, multilocular appearance causing a very fine septae in between. But mostly it presents with a unilocular condition because it is aggressive in nature. So when the expansion starts itself, mostly the patients will be noticing it. It is not like it will expand to a greater extent and the patient notices. No, initially itself we will be able to make out the dendigerous cells because the expansion is quite uh, good itself. So the patient will be recognizing the swelling initially itself not it uh, may not be taking such a long time to be recognized so usually it is a uh, presence with a unilocular completely radiolucent condition so there are uh, three types of radiologic type radiographic types there are three radiographic types associated with dendigerous cyst so the first one is called central so you can see from the neck of the tooth symmetrically the crown of the involved tooth is surrounded so this is a radiograph <clears throat> as you can see the, the molar. So here the dendigerous cyst is surrounding the uh, crown of the tooth symmetrically in a central way. So this type of radiographic appearance of dendigerous cyst is a central type of dendigerous cyst. Okay. Now, next is called as a lateral, wherein the cyst is mostly pushed towards one side of the crown. So this is the example of a lateral type of dendigerous cyst. Okay, so here you can make out such a huge expansion has occurred, but still the outline of the mandibular nerve canal can be traced. So it has not invaded. So even though the cyst pushes or displaces the tooth and the uh, I mean, adjacent structures, it may not invade the canal. So the cortical outlines of all those uh, mandibular nerve canal and all may remain intact. But this cyst is, has underwent a very huge expansion of the jaws. So you can see, can make out the thinning, the lower border of the ramus has thinned out a lot. 
okay so maybe there can be even erosion or perforations has also occurred in this condition and you can also make out here the other the first and the second molar root they have also started resorbing due to the pressure applied by the enlarging cyst okay so this is a mesoangular impacted third mandibular third molar which has developed the cyst cystic change and the third variety is called as a circumferential so here rather than involve when expanding towards the coronal structure of the tooth even though it starts from the neck it has actually enclosing both the roots of the involved tooth so that is called a circumferential type of dentigerous cyst so this is an example for the circumferential type of dentigerous cyst okay so mostly uh, see this can occur either like this or it can also occur in conditions when there is a partially erupted coronal structure So in that condition also, the cystic lining may be pushed more towards the root, enclosing the root of the tooth. So we say a tooth coming out of a donut kind of appearance also. That is another terminology, or that is another type of a circumferential variety of dentigerous cyst. It can be either like this, or if the tooth is partially erupted, then it can have the appearance of a tooth coming out of a donut kind of appearance. So some some uh, books have named such kind of uh, cyst as paradental cyst. Okay, but usually that term is discouraged because uh, many books have given even buccal bifurcation cyst have also been named as paradental cyst. So usually we avoid that term paradental cyst in those conditions. So we can say it is a type of circumferential kind of dentigerous cyst. So mainly here. it encloses the root main uh, largely it encloses the root of the involved tooth it, but you have to make sure the attachment is at the neck of the tooth only it is enclosing the roots of the involved tooth so these are a few other uh, images of the dentigerous cyst uh, so from these images we will also try to make out how the dentigerous cyst uh, shows its effects on the adjacent structures okay so here you can see uh it the cystic lining has started picture a you can see the cystic lining has started from the neck of the tooth or the cj okay so the, uh, can you tell me the picture a which is the type of the radiographic type central lateral or circumferential both a and b yeah it is a central type no quite obvious right so it is not circumferential it is a central type because it is not involving the root it is not involving the tooth root okay is just involving the crown of the involved tooth see like this this part is remaining intact this this edge you know the arrow mark in the picture the arrow mark is given a white arrow if that edge come towards the root of the tooth then we can say it is circumferential otherwise see the boundary is quite clear okay it is it is actually symmetrically uh, encompassing the crown of the involved tooth so it's a central variety you can see it has caused much of an expansion see on the upper border you know the uh, occlusal border of the jaws you can see there's quite an expansion happening but luckily the adjacent tooth root still remains intact it has not been touched but the lower border the tooth has been displaced more towards the mandibular lower border in this but in picture b it is not the thing see the adjacent uh, tooth root has been resolved okay you can see the resorption a very quite cup shaped resorption of the adjacent two root okay so the root uh, the distal root of uh, seven has been resolved in case of uh, picture b okay so it can cause resorption of the adjoining or the surrounding tooth or the involved tooth okay then the involved tooth will be mostly displaced either apically down because this is more coronally located so it can displace the tooth apically or it can even displace the tooth to such an extent that it can even go that involved tooth may go further displaced into the ramus or even up to the coronoid or the condylar process till that area it can displace the tooth due to the uh, pressure of the enlarging cyst if it involves a maxilla like in you know, a maxillary canine or maxillary molars in that in those conditions it can push towards the maxillary sinus area or the nasal floor okay then if it it can also push towards the maxillary sinus area collapse within the maxillary sinus you know and the lining can it can just uh, you know uh, eject all its contents into the maxillary sinus and then within that it can just progress okay so it can just enter and push into the maxillary sinus collapse over there eject all its contents 
or drain all its contents into the sinus and then proceed growing within the sinus. So that can happen as a very important complication when it involves a maxillary tooth, the maxillary molars and all. It's a very huge complication because it may be spreading entirely within the maxillary sinus, or it can even displace the tooth towards the nasal floor or even the floor of the orbit also. So that much propensity the dentigerosist has because it is quite an aggressive lesion. Only thing is, it is it is not invading. Uh, into the other adjacent structures, but it's actually causing displacement of the involved tooth and the adjacent structures to a higher levels. So that is the propensity of spread or expansion when it comes to dentigerous cyst. So in this condition, can you tell me which is the type of dentigerous cyst here? Radiographic type? Yes, lateral, no? very, very clear picture as this. So here you can see the tooth has been pushed towards the lower border. So it's almost touching the lower border. So in such conditions and all, if we need to remove the tooth along with the cyst, then you should reinforce the lower border before you surgically remove the tooth with the cyst. Okay, and then the cyst will start spreading or expanding more towards the ramus of the mandible. Okay, rather than an occlusal propensity showing a lateral propensity. <coughs> Sorry. Now, in this picture, uh, you can see the mainly the maxillary third molar is a culprit. Okay, so surrounding that, you can see the cyst. See the entire maxillary sinus, the left maxillary sinus is completely involved by the cyst, and even it has come to the lower alveolar border. So the alveolar process also has been involved. So it's a, such a huge cyst. It is, it is showing a lot of expansion in this region but since it is an opg there is a lot of superimposition so you might not be able to clearly identify the uh, the you know the origin of the cystic lining maybe from the neck of the tooth it's not quite clear in this so it's very difficult to make out in an opg but with the cbct or ct it will be quite clear you can make out you can take the sections and then it will be easily recognized as a cystic lining originating from the cj so that is very important finding that you should, uh, you know, uh, confirm radiologically before going into the surgical <laughs> intervention. And during surgery also, uh, you have to make sure. So what is the surgical treatment of dentigerous cyst? Usually it is a nucleation because it is quite, uh, you know, um, well confined and all. So there is no need for mass nucleation and all. Mostly you can enucleate the cyst. Okay, uh, there is no need for any aggressive treatment in most conditions, but it's, if it's quite large, then you can go for mass supinization. Mass Mostly the involved tooth, if it is an impact, third molar or not, we'll be removing the tooth along with it. But if we can save the tooth or if the tooth can be brought down by orthodontic intervention, then we'll partially open the cyst, make an orthodontic intervention, try to bring the tooth for eruption and later on, the cyst would have collapsed, then we can easily remove the cyst much without much damage to the adjacent structures, okay? So that is followed when the tooth, we can bring the eruption of the involved tooth. Like in canines and all, if we can bring the eruption of the tooth, then in such conditions, we can actually try to get the tooth erupted by orthodontic ways, and then we can ultimately remove the cyst later on. Okay, once its size reduces, we can remove the cyst later Okay. So uh, during surgery also, once you nucleate the tooth, I mean the tooth along with the cystic lining, then make sure, like, you know, you make out the uh, attachment of the cystic lining to the CEJ. Okay, that has to be confirmed. Then if at all the cystic lining, if you feel at some point the cystic lining is showing a lot more thickness or some other that cystic lining was more invading into the adjacent bone kind of things and all, then tag that area and send for histopathology because the cyst may be undergoing a neoplastic transformation. So in such conditions, you have to tag it and send it to the histopathology confirmation. So whatever it may be, whatever radiographically you make out or surgically or clinically you make out, histopathology confirmation is quite necessary. So in this, again, uh, it's an... We are developing a third molar, mandibular third molar. You can see it's a quite a huge cyst, okay? So this is, with this one, you can consider it as a uh, central variety only, but it has 
that much uh, it has spread into the or extended into the ramus up to the coronoid process okay so almost involving the entire ramus in this condition so it has spread out with quite a huge uh, propensity okay so it will cause both the uh, you know expansion of the buccal as well as the lingual cortical plates expansion thinning erosion any of these can happen erosion and all are quite rare if that much if we you know if we delay the treatment then only the uh, you know the erosion of the uh, cortexes can happen but mostly with uh, the thinning out of the cortex would have happened due to the expansion so now we'll move on to the radiographic differential diagnosis okay so very critical as well as very difficult radiographic diagnosis when it comes to a small dendrogenous cyst is an enlarged or hypoplastic follicular space so a normal follicular space is usually 2 to 3 mm thickness according to white and farrow it is given as 2 to 3 mm thickness is a normal uh, size of the follicular space so usually a cyst a dendrogenous cyst should be suspected if it is more than 5 mm in diameter so usually what we say is see this condition this is a maxillary canal but here this is just an hypoplastic follicle and it is not a dendrogenous cyst so here the in picture in the first picture and all the diameter is actually the more than 3 mm and all but still see uh, there is only a symmetric enlargement is there and the maxillary canine follicle since i told you canine usually comes a long way before eruption so it's a long standing tooth okay in that conditions what happens is the follicular space surrounding a maxillary canine can usually become hyperplastic and it usually attains this much size normal itself without a dendrogenous cystic transformation uh, the normal follicular space around a maxillary canine can take take up to this much expansion so we cannot in this condition even though this rule is violated still we cannot say there is a cystic transformation we have to be vigilant but we have to just uh, wait and see whether you know there is uh, whether the still the expansion of the follicular space is happening or is it causing any uh, damage to the adjacent uh, surrounding or the adjacent tooth and all in that conditions only we can interfere otherwise it's better not to interfere in such conditions because uh, the maxillary canine we have to take it as an exemption mostly the you know the follicular space may enlarge up to uh, a few mm okay but otherwise uh, cyst can be considered even if you know that is an asymmetrical enlargement of the follicular space usually the follicular space if it is hyperplastic that will just show a symmetric enlargement but if the follicular space is, is getting enlarged at a you know very asymmetrical way then cystic transformation should be suspected then the next one is kot what is kot it's keratocystic odontogenic tumor right so usually uh, kot should be considered as a differential diagnosis uh, for a dendrogenous cyst but mostly kot also it appears as a unilocular radiolucency but the uh, differentiating pattern is kot usually uh, it will just expand it, it will not cause much expansion of the bone it is spread within the bone see this is a uh, this is actually a multilocular lesion okay it is also involving the uh, an uninterrupted mean impacted tooth okay and the kot attachment is usually not with the cj it usually will be towards the root it will be enclosing both the coronal as well as the radicular portion of the involved tooth that is one thing another thing is kot will not cause much expansion see this is a, the picture a is that of a very huge cyst it has almost reached the coronoid and the condylar process but still can you see the slices of the ct axial slices of the ct shown below the amount of expansion is quite less so usually kot uh, the important uh, differentiating factor is kot will not cause much expansion of the bone even though it is a huge cystic lesion it is usually uh, it will be spreading within the bone okay so that won't cause much expansion of the bone and considering the attachment we can differentiate kot from dendrogenous cyst then the next one is unicystic ameloblastoma this is very small unicystic ameloblastoma which arises from the lining of the pre existing dendrogenous cyst very or it is impossible to differentiate radiographically then we have to go for a histopathologic 
diagnosis only but if the unicystic amyloblastoma has you know uh, you know it has spread a long way then okay with the amount of expansion and you know with the radiographic appearance we can make out but otherwise because amyloblastoma usually shows very huge expansion okay so with that we can make out but otherwise if it is small then it is very difficult it is impossible to differentiate that from a dangerous test radiographically we have to go for a histopathology confirmation but the, anyway the treatment is quite the same even amyloblastic fibroma the such a small amyloblastic fibroma only by histopathologic means we can confirm otherwise it is not possible to differentiate that from a dangerous cyst radiographically if it is small unicystic as well as amyloblastic fibroma amyloblastic fibroma at times it presents as a multilocular lesion but still the uh you know uh, the septa and all will be quite thin okay but the unicystic amyloblastoma also mostly both of these present as unilocular lesion that is why the uh, doubt comes but in those conditions if they are quite small very difficult or impossible to diagnose radiographically we have to go for a histopathology confirmation in these cases but both these cases we usually go for a enucleation only okay so the treatment is not going to alter a lot but the prognosis depends upon the histopathology confirmation then adenomatous odontogenic tumor and calcifying epithelial odontogenic cyst these are other dds that you should consider because you know both these conditions are also have a pericoronal presentation but then most of these conditions aot you can see uh, mostly comes in the maxillary anterior region okay and then both these conditions you will have radiographic foci within the cystic lesion mostly they will present with a radiographic foci and that is how we can differentiate them from the dendigerous cyst so we will discuss a few questions dendigerous cyst is likely to cause which neoplasia a fibrosarcoma kot amyloblastoma or adenocarcinoma yes it is amyloblastoma so the most common uh, you know uh, neoplastic transformation that can occur from a dendigerous cyst is into a unicystic amyloblastoma okay so dendigerous cyst is a very aggressive lesion so causing you know hollowing out of the entire bone involved okay and the epithelium usually shows pluripotential because of that it can try get transferred or transformed into a unicystic amyloblastoma okay or a squamous cell carcinoma and even the mucus cells within the dendigerous cystic lining can bring about a change into a muco intraosseous mucoepidermoid carcinoma also so these are a few conditions or neoplasias which can develop from a pre existing dendigerous cyst most common one is a unicystic amyloblastoma then squamous cell carcinoma and very rarely intraosseous mucoepidermoid carcinoma Dendigerous cyst is suspected if the follicular space is more than, yeah, five mm. So the normal size is two to three mm. Some some books have given three to four four mm, but according to White and Perot, it is two to three mm. But maxillary canine, it's an exemption. Okay, so in that conditions, we have to just see how the enlarged follicle is appearing, whether it is symmetric. okay or you know whether it is causing any uh, further progression is there or you know whether it is causing any damage to the adjacent structures based on that only you should decide on whether to interfere with it or not in case of maxillary canines especially the most common cyst associated with adjoining vital tooth yeah so this question is quite obvious because we are discussing only dendigerous cyst now so the answer is dendigerous cyst but why i have put this question as so you have to make sure the adjoining tooth or the associated tooth in a dendigerous cyst is usually vital in nature but it is not that with periapical cyst or lateral periodontal cyst or the radicular cyst okay so the involved tooth in a dendigerous cyst is usually vital i am talking about the not about the involved tooth or the tooth from which the dendigerous cyst is arising not the adjacent teeth okay if it causes uh the resorption of the adjacent teeth and quite obviously the teeth may become non vital but the involved tooth or the tooth which is causing the dendigerous cyst to develop that will be usually vital in nature 
Now, a well-defined unilocular radial lucency associated with the crown of an impact on mandibular third molar is most probably. It is a. So uh, here, such kind of you know explanatory questions are uh, you know a clinical scenario-based questions are quite common with meat. Okay, so they will be given. So these are all the clues that you should pick up from such questions. Like, you know, it's a well-defined lesion. So it's a unilocular radial lucency. So that is another key point. Associated with the crown of an impacted tooth. So that is the key uh, area or the key point in which you should strike. It is a demigerous cyst. Okay. Because a well-defined unilocular radial lucency can, any, can be any of these. But the crown of an impacted tooth then that is a dendigerous cyst. And also even AOT, right? It can also involve the crown of an impacted tooth. But then how come AOT most commonly is associated with a maxillary anterior region, but here it is a mandibular third molar. Then AOT, it is not completely radiolucent. You will have radiographic or radio-opaque foci. So these are all the points that you should think or that's how you should come to the differential diagnosis in these conditions. And the last one, which is the type of dendigerous cyst that you can make out from the picture, the radiographic type. Yes, it's a circumferential type. See, you can see the origin is from the CJ, but it is enclosing or it is encompassing the roots of the involved tooth. Okay, since that, see, it is not a partially erupted tooth, so we cannot go for the term paradental cyst. See, paradental cyst term is thoroughly discouraged, okay? So don't confuse with that. Uh, I just put it as a, you know, option, that's all. Okay, so it's a circumferential type of dendigerous cyst. Yeah, that finishes the session. Uh, I hope it was quite informative for you. So any queries? Yeah, so usually I told you the, you know, the involved tooth or the tooth from which the dendigerous cyst arises, that usually will be vital. That means the impacted mandibular third molar or the maxillary third molar or the canines, whatever is involved, that will be vital in nature. But if the cyst spreads to great propensity and if it involves the adjacent tooth, like at the second molar root causing resorption, then we cannot expect that to be a vital tooth, right? So those tooth may become non-vital. Uh, uh, later on, but the involved tooth or the associated tooth will be vital in nature. Uh, complications is what uh, mainly the, uh, you know, the, depending upon the amount of expansion, the complications can vary, like, you know, how come it is involving the roots of the adjacent teeth? Is it pushing the mandibular nerve canal? Then that can cause numbness, paresthesia, very uncommon in dendigerous but if the patient keeps it for such a long time, then uh, thinning out of the bone. So that can lead to pathologic fractures, crepitus, pathologic fracture. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, crepitus, pathologic fracture. Then, uh, you know, uh, other complication is like, you know, long standing cystic lesion uh, may become, uh, or it can bring about a neoplastic transformation into an amyloblastoma. Then that is quite, uh, you know, very difficult to manage, right? It is more, uh, uh, you know, aggressive than a normal dendigerous cyst. Because dendigerous cyst usually brings about a good prognosis. Once it's properly enucleated and the tooth or the factors are removed, then it brings about a good prognosis. Chances of recurrences are now are very, very rare. But if it progresses to an amyloblastoma, then it's quite, um, it's a very uh, work, difficult prognosis in that condition. Okay. That depends upon the size of the lesion. Like, you know, uh, if it's mostly we do an enucleation because, you know, within that time itself, the patient would have noticed. So, masculization means, you know, if that has, if it has propensed with such great propensity, then usually masculization to preserve the bone, that is when we do masculization. And another condition is, as I told you, uh, you know, only a part of the cyst would be removed and, you know, it will be left there for the two, for the orthodontic, uh, you know, eruption to uh, bring about the orthodontic eruption of the tooth, then in that case, we can wait. And later on, uh, once the cystic lining you know, comes down, then we can remove the cyst later on. So the enucleation is the most common procedure, along with the involved tooth is the most common thing done. 
but then restaurant depends upon the uh, type location and you know the uh, amount of expansion so that is a surgeon's call actually any other queries okay uh, i hope that was informative for you all uh, thank you very much for your patient listening okay thank you very much have a nice day all of you so i hope to see all of you uh, in the future focus classes yeah what is there uh, suggesting what is the doubt yeah non vital tooth as i told you uh, see uh, in radicular cyst obviously why the radicular cyst is happening that is because there is a pipal involvement and that is what is bringing about the radicular cystic change right it is it is that whatever the inflammatory process it is spreading into the uh, you know periapical region causing the radicular cyst so obviously non vital tooth is associated with the radicular cyst but any cystic lesion if it progresses and involves the uh, adjacent tooth that can bring about a non vital uh, adjacent tooth we are i am not talking about the involved tooth in the dentigerous cyst the involved tooth that is a imagine there is a mandibular third molar causing the dentigerous cyst means the mandibular third molar involved that would be vital it will not be non vital in a dentigerous cyst that's what i meant with that uh, statement okay so i hope that is clear so thank you very much for your patient listening so see you all in the uh, focus classes thank you have a nice day